but failed. Mark, why do you think that these white supremacist gangs seem to be the top of the pyramid when it comes to violence? Right, that's true. And I can't, it's kind of a unique phenomenon. I can't, really, I can't really explain it. I don't know that anybody knows, but I think that they've grown in power and popularity and uh, they're responsible for smuggling a great deal of narcotics. Uh, they're responsible for a great deal of um, extortions. They're responsible for a great deal of assaults, and they're responsible for a great deal of murders, both in the prisons and outside on the streets. Uh, they're very much a threat, certainly here in Southern California. That first meeting with Mark paid off in an unexpected way. The wall of silence began to crumble. I've been knocking on the door of one police department for days, Costa Mesa PD, deep in the heart of Orange County. Then, all of a sudden, I got what I needed. A ride along with the guys doing battle with Peni and the Nazi lowriders. This is their frontline headquarters. I'm here for a briefing before the nighttime hunt. Hey, Ross, how you doing? Come on in. Thank you. Everybody here knows Ross? Yeah. All right, let's go over this stuff. All right, got a couple targets tonight. Uh, we got... Uh... Jeremiah, who's out, we all know he's doing a lot of dope and some other things. Uh, I got this is Brent Costa Mesa gang enforcement team. All I can tell you is they're called Brent, Dave, Eric, and Gabe. And that vandal were convicted of attempt murder on um, Campbell, stabbed him like three or four times. Uh, he's out, and he's on. Uh, he's living on 16th Street. I'll go say hi to Ray. I haven't seen him in a while. Okay, we got James Cook. He had something to do with that uh, stabbing over there off the 241, right? Yeah, a surviving twin that didn't die was uh, living with him for a while. Didn't we have a file on him? At last, I was seeing some faces, and along with each mugshot came a grisly back catalogue of violence. One obvious thing that marked these guys out was that they were tattooed from head to toe. He's got your OC, the PDS, Swazi, so. Um, PDS stands for Peni Death Squad. OC stands for Orange County Skinheads, and there's no shortage of swastikas. He's probably got He's a good uh, target. some juice with Peni since there's not that many people out right now. And uh, last, we got Ian Ashby. He wanted to uh, lure Robert Messenger over so they could kill him. Yeah. Some kind of joint uh, OC skin Peni operation. Yeah, I've got no love for Ian. All right, everybody ready? Ross, all right, let's do it. The target selected for tonight is the Mesa Motor Inn. It's a notorious haunt for Peni. Let's do it. I was about to cross the threshold into a very violent world. This shocking footage shows a Nazi lowrider stabbing an African-American boy through the heart. All he'd done was look into his car. Costa Mesa police will testify at the forthcoming murder trial. Some of them, especially if they've been using uh, large quantities of uh, meth, uh, can be pretty violent. Obviously, we carry protective vests, Kevlar helmets. Uh, uh, you know, we have a variety of uh, firearms we carry, uh, handguns and rifles, uh, depending on what what kind of situation we're going into. We are here. This is the Mesa Motor Inn. And this is full of undesirables. Yes, you would not want to rent a room here. The Mesa Motor Inn serves as a halfway house between prison and the streets for these white gangsters. Ready to go? Ready to go. All right, let's go. Most of them are on parole, and this gives the police an opportunity to keep them under close surveillance and enforce their parole conditions. Hey, 
Police the department, door. open the door. Police department, open the door. Okay, door shut, open the door. Doing? Police department, who's all in here? Police department. Whose room is this? Okay, so the owner of the room is not here, correct? No. Okay. It's the, last time you used it. the first thing that struck me was that the cops were coming down very hard. I thought they'd never get away with this back home. That's 22 days, brother. You sure you want to roll the dice on uh, your parole status being good after three weeks? Was the last time you saw Mr. Morris? This lot looked more scared than the cops. Maybe it was with good reason. This guy confessed he'd just taken a hit of methamphetamine. It violated his parole. Close your eyes. Here, give me your last name. You're delayed on that. S-I-M-S. Who do you claim now? Who do you run with? No. Okay. You don't run with anybody? Nope. What are your beliefs? As in? As in uh, white supremacy or skinheads? Well, I believe that. You don't believe in any of it? I do. You do? What? So are you in the white gang, sir? Were well, you in the white gang? No, I'm not in one, but Have you I believe been? what they believe. You believe what they believe? Yeah. Uh, what do you think they believe? What do they believe? I don't like blacks. Blacks, Mexicans, no. We used to together with white people. But that's as far as it'd go with his racist views. Gang members are now wise to the fact that if the police can link racist beliefs to crime, they'll face a long prison stretch. So they keep their mouths shut. This arrest is just for a routine parole violation. How many times have I arrested you? Can you count? Yeah, it's a lot of times, huh? But the last time the police pulled this guy, they were looking for something much, much bigger. Uh, several months ago, they actually uh, smuggling money back to uh, uh, the Middle East, and they don't know where it went. Upwards of six, what was six hundred million? Six hundred million dollars over a six-year period. Uh, uh, went back to the Middle East for terrorist purposes. This case involves a Lebanese businessman and alleged money laundering. It was amazing to think that this guy could be involved in anything that big. <laughs> Those guys looked like they were white affiliated gang members. Yes. They were, weren't they? I mean, we, are, we talked to one of them about it. Yes. When we asked him why he was, he didn't really have much of an answer. When you asked him, well, why are you a white supremacist? I don't know. You know, he didn't know. He didn't have any answers. Either that or he didn't want to give those, uh, those answers on film. And, and, you know, and to tell you the truth, he, he probably couldn't just because, he, you know, he'll claim it. That's who we'll hang with. And, no real answer. I hate black yeah. people was one of the answers. Don't like you know, black and people. The, but, and then oh, he said, but then he said yeah. Mexicans as well. But he admits, I got to work with them. I got to work yeah, with them because I got to get the dope from them. I need to do things like that. So. Yeah, yeah. Now, Mexicans and drug deals, I get. But Lebanese businessmen and international fraud, well, uh, that's something else. And to the tune of $600 million. Thanks. Appreciate it. But the police are treating Pinai as a major threat. And it's not only about guns and drugs. They're now focusing on identity theft, financial fraud, and terrorism. The suspect, the passer, goes into the stores and they try to pass the checks or credit cards. This training session is designed to get police up to speed with Peni's venture into big time white collar crime. Computer stores and things like that. And not only do they involve in, uh, in guns and, and drugs, they also are dealing in high end identity theft uh, schemes. And all this equipment that you see here are the devices that they use to facilitate the crimes that they commit. And they're worth a ton of money. Um, you're talking several thousand dollars each for one of these items here. This one here is close to about $10,000. This technology has evolved kind of faster than, than we have as, in law enforcement. We're still looking for dope and we're still looking for weapons, which are good things to do, but the damage that these people are doing through identity theft is just astronomical. Global fraud, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in single transactions. There was actually a case where uh, one of the P&I members was able to bail out of, of jail using uh, counterfeit checks that they were able to manufacture. So the sophistication and the level of fraud that they're doing is, is just amazing. Uh, they can put your homes up as collateral sometimes for bail. So they can be gone for several years uh, without you even knowing that they took out 50 grand or 100, 100 grand against your house. I've been barred from this training session to protect the identity of the cops working the streets because the police insist their men have become targets for Peni and Nazi lowrider assassins. It was such a disturbing claim, I had to follow it up. So I paid a visit to the district attorney's office. The DA's officer in charge of gang investigations for all of Orange County is Al Valdez. 
in the gang culture, to earn your respect, you had to be violent. The Nazi lowriders took that to a very, very new level for people in this particular county and in Southern California in general. They became very violent. They would assault police officers. Um, they would uh, lead you in a pursuit, and after pursuit, get out and shoot at you. We didn't see that behavior with our, our other gangs, at least not as often as we saw with the Nazi lowriders. And the Penis also became very active. Uh, Penis would threaten you, uh, would threaten prosecutors, would threaten police officers. It was as if they were running with reckless abandon, thinking that that intimidation would cause some kind of reaction in the law enforcement community here, like back down. So our contacts with them on the street, all of our red flags are up. We don't take any chances with them at all because they are the kind of gangsters that will shoot it out or assault you. Let me see your hands! Let me see your hands right now! In Orange County, California, there's a daily battle going on between white racist gangs and the police. And Sergeant Clay Epperson was there the day full-scale war broke out in the genteel suburbs of Costa Mesa. So where are we going then, Clay? Well, we're going to go to an apartment complex that was the first significant presence of uh, Nazi lowriders here in uh, Costa Mesa. Right. Kind of. This a, is a very nice area, isn't it? Yeah, it's mixed rental, uh, you know, single-family homes. So when these guys showed up on the picture, they were engaged in property crime, narcotic sales, and a, a lot of violence. <clears throat> and so for us, being a small community in Orange County, they were unusually uh, aggressive. Okay. Did you mount raids in the building? Yes. This was our piece of it. This is where we got involved. So how many of them were in here? Over, I mean, we took many. I, I can't give you an exact number, but went to the back apartment upstairs, and, and they fired multiple rounds, firing through the door. The door was closed on their guns, and they were firing randomly through the door, through the crack in the door. In terms of day-to-day -day gang violence in this community, this was a level of violence that was unprecedented for us. Let me see your hands! Let me see your hands right now! Even this simulated siege brought casualties. Well, the jeans are going to have to go to man. <laughs> <laughs> he likes pain. Sorry. Okay. So but the real message came over loud and clear. This is how far the police are prepared to go in their war against Penai and the Nazi lowriders. Well, I posted here because I thought our immediate threat was in the room. And there was somebody here? Yes. Hootie and Sergeant Culver tapped up, check this little area here. Yeah, immediate threat. Check this area. This facility in Orange County is a mock-up of suburbia, down to the last detail. I've worked on film sets that are less believable. One thing they've said to us is the closer they simulate the real thing, the better they are on the day. And, you know, this is quite an amazing setup here. I mean, it feels very real. But what I really needed now was to see things a little more from the gang's point of view. I contacted a former narcotics cop, now a white gang specialist. Ken Whitley has been collecting data on Southern California's unique gang problem for the last decade. Tattoos are important to these people, aren't they? Creating an image. Isn't that rather stupid if you uh, tell everybody who you are? Well, in a, in a way, that's, that's one of the rites of passages. That's one of the badges of, of honor. That's one of the things that that they, uh, they do to show their racial pride and their racial purity and their commitment. Well, here we have a, an individual who is an active member of one of these groups we've been talking about. Jesus, his neck's been completely severed, hasn't it? Or not, not severed completely, but it's yeah. sliced. And he's sitting in a chair in the medical unit waiting to be stitched up. Now, I don't know about That's you, but I'd probably be on, be on the ground rolling around screaming and yelling That's if my neck was serious sliced. Cut, isn't it? This is a soldier. So, how am I going to find these guys? These guys? Oh. You want to go actually talk to these guys? Well, that's the plan. I know you've had some experience with, with gangs in other countries, but this is nothing like you've ever seen before. These guys are committed, they're armed, uh, they're not out and about that easily. You're not going to just drive around and find them. 
And frankly, if you get lucky enough to find them, it's going to be uh, not a real safe place to be. Is that lucky enough to find them or unlucky enough? Lucky enough to find. There you go. So uh, good luck, my friend, (laughs) in your journey. The next few days, my journey was everywhere. I followed every lead and continued riding along with the cops. But I kept coming up against a brick wall. It's going to be very difficult to find an individual that's going to say, yeah, I'm part of P9 or NLR and tell us about their belief system because they're concerned for their safety. Uh, And if they were to do that, they would be in a lot of trouble, so they'd be a target. Every person I try to speak to virtually in every corner I turn, I seem to be coming up against silence or a brick wall. Um, someone else has just let us down, and it's virtually the same story. Yeah, I'll speak to you, I'll speak to you. You go to a range of time to meet them, and I'm sorry, I've got to go out of town for a period of time. There seem to be dark arts conspiring to uh, stop us making this program, and um, well, I'm getting very, very suspicious. I think there are a lot of scared people out there. Um, we're waiting for uh, a unit to meet up with us because we're going to be outnumbered. Is this potentially a volatile situation? Yeah, it could be. We know there's three guys there that are P9 and Nazi lowriders. Police department. But by the time our backup arrived, the main man had flown the coup. Dude, check it out. He's beefed up. That's him. Is Logan here? No. No? No, he's not. When was the last time he was here? Oh, God, it's been a while. Did you come on in? Evening, guys. Yeah. This is my daughter. Okay, okay. You know, this, no, this is my house right here. Okay, okay. you don't want him in your house? I don't want him in here. Seriously, this is okay. my house. Okay, all right. I got my daughter. I'm simply asking you. You could either say yes or no, and that's fine. I mean, if I don't want you guys to, like, take me off and hang me. No. Why would I do that? I actually know them because you know my space. Okay. It's my family right here. You got it, man. All right. Take it easy. This time, I'd barely got through the door, and I couldn't get a single word out of any of the remaining gang members. Maybe I'd got too close to the cops, so I decided to go it alone. I followed a lead that took me to the Santa Ana House of Correction. I made enough of a nuisance of myself to get to see a notorious convicted Peni commander called Darrell Mason. But as usual, there was a catch. I could see him and use my tape recorder, but the camera was barred. Daryl, um, am I correct in assuming that you are a member of a gang? Yes, it's, it's public enemy number one, death squadron. Right. But uh, it's easier to just say P9, and it's a skinhead gang. Yeah. How does it operate? There's a lot of things that go on. There's drug distribution, murder for hire, furtherance of our political views. Can you tell me about your political views? You know, P9 typically is a white power gang, and that's what it's all about. Something about, you know, producing a good future for our white kids. 88 precepts on how to live and what not to do and how to speak and how to treat people and everything. Some guys in prison get red braces tattooed on their body. You know, represents they killed a black guy. I mean, I've got 187, which represents murder, tattooed on me. What was the 187 for again? That's a penal code for murder. So that means you committed the murder? Uh, I don't know if I want to go into that, but uh, if you wanted to kill somebody, I mean, it's, how hard is it? You know? Shave yourself down, you, you put some grease on and some baby powder, put some clothes on, get you a Glock with an interchangeable barrel, load it up, kill the person, toss an ounce of speed on him, it's done. It was a drug killing. That's how easy it is. But uh, there's not too many people that have the cojones to talk to you about it. Exactly. Why is that? If they're gang members, and these are hard people, tough people, why don't, they, why don't they want to speak to us? Well, the last guy who did what I'm doing got killed for it, so... You don't think they could touch you, or...? No, I don't. I'm much higher up. Right. So, I just have, I have a big reputation in prison. This is Scott Miller, known as Scottish, and he also had a big reputation in Peni until he gave this interview to Fox News. Gun, speed, violence, and sex, and that's what, uh, that's what it's all about. This is what you call methamphetamine, it's glass. I'll do whatever I have to do to make the money. Eight months after the interview, 
Penai caught up with Scottish. Inside this tarpaulin are the remains of Corey Laymans, who also talked out of turn. This could be the main reason I'm coming up against silence. The penalty for talking to the media, it seems, is death. These white racist gangs prefer to use the web to spread their message. One kid said something to another kid, and the, the other kid hit him over the head and smashed his brains, and then he's dead. Yeah, a nigga did it. So they, how, how about that? You know, if a white kid would bash the brains in of a black kid, it'd be international news. International news. But a white kid get his brains beat in by a, 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 a black guy? No, not even the L.A. Times didn't want to talk about that. This is the voice of Tom Metzger, trying to convince the white majority that they're really a persecuted minority. His group, White Aryan Resistance, promotes on the web and in their press a nightmare version of society where everyone who isn't white is a mortal enemy. The gangsters of Peni and the NLR really lap this stuff up. White Aryan Resistance calling. White Aryan Resistance calling. You tell me a bit about the White Aryan Resistance. We're interested in one thing, and that's the race issue and the well-being of the white race, or at least the part of the white race that gives a damn. The white race, they said, well, we have to bring the non-whites up to our level. No, they brought the white race down to the third world level. They're creating white morons in this country, and I want to stop that and breed back up. Racism is alive and well and growing. All we need now is some violence to happen on that border, gunshots, and this whole Southern California is going to go up. Can we go back to the gangs again? Sure. White I gangs? I want to call them insurgents, not gangs. What about gangs like Nazi lowriders and public enemy number one? Do you think they could become insurgents? I think they will. I don't want skinheads beating up on blacks in the streets. I want them dragging politicians out of their offices and hanging them. And in England, too. And believe me, you need it more there than we even need it here. We've got a little room to move around. You don't have much time to pull it out in England, or England's all through. There was a lawsuit brought against you, wasn't there? Yes. For the death of a black person? Yes. And that lawsuit was successful, wasn't it? Yes. But if you knew the background to the suit, you'd think it was crazy. Uh, they said that I sent an agent to Portland, Oregon, and that agent went out over a period of months or weeks and got with skinheads and taught them to go out and beat up people. Well, they didn't need to be taught how to beat up people. And then they said that I set this all up. Well, it was a civil trial, and uh, I needed two people on the jury to be on my side. I only had one. <laughs> So they got me for $10 million, and I wrote a check and went on. Oh, let's talk about revolution. What revolution. How about that? Come on now. Music helps this medicine go down. It's part of the toxic mix that fires up these skinheads to commit acts of violence and even murder. And Tom Metzger knows it. He uses these gigs as a platform for his extremist rant. But it's the music that really pulls in the crowds. I got hold of a CD compilation of this stuff. It's called Project Schoolyard, and it's aimed specifically at young kids. One of the most famous bands on this CD is a band called Extreme Hatred. Now, they've been around a long time. Um, they take influence from the UK skinhead bands that came here in the 80s. Um, the lead singer is um, a guy called Marty Cox, and he is extremely proud of the fact that he is a neo-Nazi. Extreme Hatred regularly play to audiences here in Orange County. But they also claim to have fans around the world. I have to say, I'm not one of them. Yeah. Now what? 
I've uh, come outside partly to get some air and partly because my ears were bleeding. Uh, but just in case you weren't getting the message, here are some of the lyrics. The bastards think because we are white they can push us around without a fight. They'll pull their guns when they start to lose. They gun us down, it's just more bad news. But times have changed as of today. We're shooting back, it's time for them to pay. So listen up, the hammer's swung. Justice is served when the scum is hung. Byron, eat your heart out. I actually read the words. We're going to kill them, we're going to shoot them, we're going to get them. Uh, again, and do you not think that if a kid reads that and listens to that time and time over again, it might, it might make him possibly want to go out and do those things. Just like the, the niggers have the rap music with Cop Killer and Kill Whitey, you know, they have their music for their beliefs, and we've got ours. If we're playing a show, and if you're a Mexican at our show, you're going to get beat up. Let's be frank about it, you know? The crowd's just not going to allow that to happen. Can I go back to the symbols? Isn't one of your record labels a load of Jews being pushed into a, a pit? <laughs> isn't it? I mean, that's right, yeah. isn't it? Sure. Yeah. But isn't that... And a guy with a big smiley face doing it. <laughs> Do you think that's going to be offensive to Jewish people? God, I oh, hope so. Yeah, I hope so. You know, because we've been... Because everything they do is offensive to me. Yeah, well, you know, we've been offended by their, their lives for the last, you know, 60 years, you know, about the, the Holocaust and stuff, you know. There's no doubt that Jews died. Yeah, boo-hoo. Lots of people died. You know? I have no sympathy. I have no sympathy for any of them. It's a war. People die during wars. People get killed. We know that Tom Metzger and various people have, have operated a kind of recruitment thing that goes through schools. I mean, what do you think about things like that? It's, it's not like we're recruiting them and, and ask, asking them to join us. It's just, hey, here we are. Why is it not like that, then? What's that's, that? that's what it seems like. It seems like recruitment to me. Uh, yeah, well, you can take it how you want to, but, you know, really all it is is here we are, and you're more than welcome to, to you know, to come and enjoy the things that we do, you know? But you should have seen the people flock around, you know, just regular high school kids, you know, jocks and surfers, skaters, everyone flocking around to get, you know, and again, to, it, get the, it, to get the literature. It goes back to this, to where... The white kids are feeling threatened, you know, and they see us as a as a group of guys that that stick together through the thick and thin, and they and they they're attracted to that because they they see that as a as a security, you know. So. Marty and Scott, what uh, fine specimens of the Aryan super race those two were. And uh, I hate this and I hate that. They're like five year old kids in a playground. And I, you know, I'd like to treat them as a joke, but unfortunately I can't because what they espouse, what they write about, the following they have, the recruiting that they actively do to get people to join white supremacist skinhead gangs. I think there's a very serious side to that. In a pleasant suburb in neighbouring Riverside County, in a prosperous house, lives a black family under siege from race hate gangs. Their target is 18-year-old Pierre Rodin. He's been suffering racist abuse at their hands since he was 11 years old. I stay up until like 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning because I'm looking out of my window. I'm worrying about yeah. when this is actually going to happen, when they are going to kill me. I'm not afraid of dying, but I'm afraid of the way that I actually might die because I, I fear that they might actually kill me in front of my sister or my family if we don't move. And it's like, what I see at school is a lot of kids getting others to join this. It's like a movement in which they're getting others to join this in class and stuff like that. I can't focus in school because I have to worry about the guy behind me and the guy on the side of me threatening to fight me and stab me and stuff like that. The boys were um, threatening me in the car, telling me what they were going to do to me and my daughter, um, banging on the hood, knocking on the windows, and she was scared. The police didn't have no control, control over them. They had them. to, they, like, literally force them on the yeah, ground. They had to, for them to use stop. a lot of force to get them to stop. And I mean, I, so I, the police said, I'm just banging on the car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they look at me and they go, you're next, nigger. You're next. We're going to get you next. I endured kids spitting on me, peeing on my clothes while I'm in the swimming pool throwing dirty panties on my desk and I'm still not fighting. I'm not even thinking about fighting because that shows that I'm a bigger person. Now I understand when I read on the newspaper how kids kill themselves because of this stuff. I understand how they feel. I understand why it happens. This is TJ Layden. He knows why it happens. He used to be part of the problem. Now I grew up in a very, very, very white town. 
somebody was black, Hispanic, or Asian, and they were caught in my neighborhood, that's a nut. Crack! I'll hit you, somebody else will hit you in the side of the head, you fall down, you get up, I swear to God, I'll freaking kill you! I watched one guy walk up, walk up to a guy one night, and humiliate him, urinate on him in front of everybody. Before he could get up and out of his chair, I grabbed him, I socked him, he fell over the side of the chair, and after that, it was nothing but boots and fists. And when we had finished with him, we had cracked and broke ribs on both sides of his body. We had separated his shoulder. We had broken his jaw, his nose. One of my friends with his steel cap Doc Martin boots on, like a football player would kick a field goal, literally as hard as he could, came straight across the bridge of the boy's mouth. Now, the boy couldn't protect himself, because this time he's semi-unconscious. One of my buddies laying across his arm and holding it down, and my big old fat friend was stepping off to his hand off to the side. And no longer was I going to be a street soldier out there attacking and beating people up. So I became a racist recruiter, actively targeting kids from the age of 12 years old and older to join the white power movement. Guys, this is the way I live my life, man. This was normal. You may think it's freaking crazy. You were kind of very well thought of inside many white supremacist organizations. I mean, you know, you know Metzger very well, don't you? You all did. Yeah, I knew, my, I knew Tom and John Metzger pretty well. How dangerous are they? They're extremely dangerous. Tom was just like, run, guys, run. Do whatever you want. We'd beat up somebody, attack somebody, there'd be a, a write up in the paper, an assault, send it in Tom Metzger, he'd print it in his magazine. These are the two men who cost Tom Metzger $10 million. Their confession to murder led to Metzger's conviction for the death of this man. Malagita Saror was beaten to death. In California, race hate violence is already a serious problem. But the federal government believes it's about to escalate to a whole new level. They've brought in the FBI to tackle the threat head on with tough new measures. Uh, hello? This is the FBI. Can we help you? Uh, yeah, it's Ross Kemp. I'm meeting FBI special agent in charge of counterterrorism, Randy Parsons. Randy, can you tell me why? P9, this white supremacist gang, are of a particular interest to the FBI. We go back to uh, the Oklahoma City bombing and, and Timothy McVeigh. That was the most substantial act of domestic terrorism on American soil prior to 9-11. Timothy McVeigh had a white supremacist background. So we look at, is there an organizational structure to this? Is there a conspiracy among individuals that raises that above the the crime that the individual commits and have uh, p and i being deemed a a terrorist threat absolutely they're one of the groups that's in our crosshairs uh, we attack them at uh, at multiple levels mostly with our with our state and local law enforcement partners but the trump card in the government's hand is this a rico it stands for racketeering influence corrupt organizations in the past, it's been reserved for use against the Mafia. Now, RICO is being used against these members of the Aryan Brotherhood, the oldest white supremacist gang in America. They could be facing the death penalty. The Brotherhood, also known as the Brand, have been in jail since the 60s. But even from their prison cells, they've been the real power behind all white gangs until now. I've come up against a wall of silence all down the line, but on this subject, even the authorities won't talk to me. Then, someone finally picked up the phone. The killers, they don't, nobody talks, they're gonna die. Well, I look over my shoulder every day. I, I live in, the, in my rear view mirror and get the most out of each day because you never know what, what day is gonna be my last. How long have you been associated with uh, P9? Since about 1978. So that's a, a long time, isn't it? Yes, sir. I became one of the generals, you know? There was an ideology going on at that time. Were you sharing the same political views? Yeah, it got started with, you know, with it coming down from the Aryan Brotherhood of you need to follow these, these Aryan traits, you know? So the brand were giving orders to you what, while you were inside? Correct. The brand is the cream of the crop. That's where everybody wants to go and they will do their bidding and kill for them. Mm. People that are calling the shots, they don't care about themselves, they don't care about others. They're never getting out. They're all going to trial right now. The brand. Looking at the death penalty in the federal courts. Right. If the Aryan Brotherhood do go down at this RICO, who do you think will f fill their shoes, as it were? 
who's going to take their place. Yeah. For the time being, it'll be P9. Will the AB let that happen? I believe they're already validating P9 in prison. It's all power struggle. Power struggle? Yes. Right. Up in Pelican Bay, after all the killings, they separated the whites, so there would be no more killings amongst our race. There are a lot of inter-gang killings inside between members of P9, members of NLR. Up in Pelican Bay, yes. Yeah. You spent time there, yeah? Yes, I have. So if you're told to actually kill someone by the Aryan Brotherhood, the brand, then you have to carry that out? Correct. And what happens if you don't? You're going to die. If you don't do something that you're told to do, the same thing that you're told to do is going to happen to you. Mm. If, if I wanted to go and meet someone from Pino, uh, face to face, where would I have to go? A prison. Or any particular prison? Pelican Bay right now. You are, you are recommending Pelican Bay to be the best place for me to go, yeah? Oh, yeah. That's, that's a criminal problem. Nothing focuses the mind like a long, long drive, and I had a lot to think about. Why had there been a spate of murders amongst the white gangs in Pelican Bay? And was there really a power struggle going on right at this moment? As you can see, the weather's changed. That's because we're in the northern part of, of California. It took a day to get here. The reason we've come here is because five miles up that road is um, the maximum security state penitentiary for California. It's where the brand, the Aryan Brotherhood, run their empire from. Um, it's also where a lot of the Peni guys and a lot of the uh, Nazi lowriders are incarcerated. I'm heading for the secure housing unit, the SHU. A prison within the prison. It's a deadly environment, so body armor is mandatory. This is the exercise yard. An inmate comes in here for an hour and a half every day. Most of the time he's locked up. It's 20 feet by 10 feet. I have to say, if this was my hour and a half, I wouldn't be very happy. This is why they're kept isolated. These white gangs have started killing each other. This wasn't a fatal stabbing, but only just. The shoe has its own resident investigator. Here, it's Devon Hawks. He's had his hands full with the recent gang warfare. What happened here back in 2000, the Aryan Brotherhood decided to try to bring the Nazi lowriders under their control. So they went around and identified from the Nazi lowriders who were the most influential in the gang. They brought in the top five Nazi lowrider members and made them members of the Aryan Brotherhood. They effectively divided this gang and set it against itself. For example, this individual, this is Irish Dennis Murphy. His loyalty was questioned, and they took him out. This gang requires blood in, blood out. Blood out, he's out of the gang now. In this unit, there are a group of lifers who are now all out of the gang, because they refuse to take part in the Aryan Brotherhood's Night of the Long Knives. The order to kill members of their own gang, in some cases their cellmates, as a test of loyalty. Now they're under sentence of death from their former comrades in the Aryan Brotherhood and the Nazi lowriders. They'll spend the rest of their lives secluded from the prison population. By agreeing to talk to me, these five men are getting a rare outing but it will bring them under the hateful gaze of young gangsters gunning for their blood. Does it matter what you are, what gang you're in? Yes, it matters. Why, is it, why does it matter? Aryan Brotherhood runs the show for the white inmates in California. Everybody else is subservient to them. 
So you'd rather be AB than anything else? Yes. And that's what these other gangs, why they are subservient, because they want to move up the food chain to be in the Aryan Brotherhood. It was always a much more exclusive group. There's never been large numbers in the AB. It was, the quality philosophy was quantity. quality over quantity. So anyone had a connection with Peanut here? I, I've been around them, but they're not considered really white, a white power. They're not a skinhead gang anymore. It's a criminal organization. It's, it's, it, they do dope. They're not recognized by a lot of the skins because they do dope. All they are is a, a dope shooting clique on the street uh, uh, or uh, in the crime. That's all they are. They're not that racial identity is bullshit or bogus. Excuse me. I mean, but comparative ever... to the brand and, the, and, and NLR. Were you associated with a gang? Yeah? All right, that one time, I, I guess. Which was? Can you tell me what gang it was? Uh, Aaron Brother. Aaron Brother. Yeah. But uh, now I'm nobody. There's a RICO case going on at the moment where um, a number of, of the brand are probably going to be put on death row. Um, is it going to stop the brand from operating? No. 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 They just pass it. No. The Aaron Brotherhood is not going to be dissolved. They're back there recruiting right now in, in C12 shoe. You know, they got their little cronies coming in and, and uh, you know, they're not going to be dissolved. We were told that if the AB was ever removed or dissolved itself, Peni might be the inheritors. No, oh, hell no. 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 What about if you the... get a group of them together on a yard, they, they, they do tend to get a little power going. They bump their gun. On, 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 on some yards now, because they're, they they're, they're getting real deep, and on some yards, level four yards, where they get deep and there's a bunch of them, they do get a, a little power show. They're somewhat organized. They're somewhat organized. But these five have been out of circulation for years, and their take was contrary to the information given to me by my mystery phone caller. So I sought out gang investigator Devon Hawks again for a more informed opinion. Devon, can you tell me who do you think will replace the, uh, the brand, the Brotherhood? The Peni certainly is one of those who are being considered as a major force and to even take a leadership role. So the success of the Peni really will depend on their ability to communicate. And if we can do anything about that, we are going to continue to try to stop their communication and stop their organization efforts because it is not in the best interest of public safety. This is a threat, and we recognize that. Have you ever come across Tom Metzger's name being mentioned as a person that supplies ideology to these, to these white gangs? We've seen skinheads who have identified with uh, Metzger Every now and then we, we do see correspondence even go, going to him or to his organization. Well, I'm always working on, a, on the next generation. I got a couple of generations under my belt now. At the age of 67, I call myself the Johnny Appleseed of the racist movement. I, my job is to plant seeds, and I've planted a lot of them over the years. And uh, as time goes on, uh, they'll be much smarter, much stronger, and maybe even more ruthless people on the scene than I am. I came out here to find a street gang, but what I found was far more sinister. An underground movement intent on provoking all-out race war. The FBI recognized these guys as a terrorist threat, and I think that makes the likes of Tom Mexico very, very happy. If they don't keep an eye on this problem, I think it's going to escalate, and they're going to turn around one day and find they've got a monster that they can't control.